welcome. Well, we haven't talked theology in a while, have we? We've talked a lot about goofy things. I've made a lot of goofy videos, but we haven't gotten into one of these kind of deeper theological streams in a while. And these are not uh, the easiest. They're not the most popular. We know the hardcore Jason Elsis fans enjoy them. And I want to thank you guys for tagging along, for being here. Um, actually, I wasn't really planning on doing a theological stream. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, no, let's let's do that. Because that's, you know, ultimately that's what matters. But um, so I was listing different things that everybody's kind of talking about, all the stuff that people are worried about. I'm kind of surprised more evangelicals aren't freaking out thinking it's the end of the world but then again i guess they think that QAnon is gonna save everybody or whatever so i want to talk about prophecies uh antichrist i want to talk about that kind of stuff what the patristic view is how there's actually solutions in the Orthodox canon of Scripture that you're missing in the other canons of Scripture. Now, that's not to say that uh, everybody in the other traditions gets everything wrong. They don't. Uh, but I think that you got two big things that you get in Orthodoxy that are big aids to this that you don't find in like uh, Protestant groups, and that's the Church Fathers and the Liturgy. The Church Fathers and the Liturgy uh, become key aids to help us interpret the text because the Bible itself is part of a liturgical tradition. It's part of a tradition of daily readings in the ancient church. And the fact that they were part of those daily readings is partly how we know what the canon of Scripture is, as we've shown in many of the lectures and talks. So we have to be aware of this and understand that the, that the liturgy is a accumulation of centuries of wisdom of the church. Now, the reason we put such a strong belief and emphasis in the historic visible church is because Christ promised to a historic visible group of people that the Holy Spirit would be with that group to lead it and guide it into truth and protect it from error that would not be overcome by error. Doesn't mean there won't be squabbles, there won't be periods where there's a a lot of people who believe error, but in toto, the church will never at any point be completely consumed by error. There will always be solid orthodox or right believing bishops in the world and faithful by extension, even in periods of mass apostasy. So we're going to get into some of these uh, kind of tough issues tonight and some of the tough doctrines that bug a lot of people. And hopefully I can cover this in a profitable way. There's a specific article I want to bring out that a lot of people don't know about. Actually, actually, there's two, so maybe I should bring both of these up. We'll get to that later, but... Uh, So the first one that we want to talk about uh, is, is if, you, if you've listened to the totality of the Genesis lectures, which we completed all those, we got all through the entirety of Genesis, and uh, then you heard the important prophecy in Genesis 49, which is the prediction of when the Messiah would come. And uh, when this prediction is given, Jacob prophesies something very specific that is a key indicator that would let the people of Israel know that their Messiah had come. That key indicator is Genesis 49, 10 and 11. It says, who will rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his loins until Shiloh comes. And unto him will be the expectation of the nations. He will bind his colt to a vine and his donkey's colt to its branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his blood, and his clothes with the blood of grapes. His eyes are gladdened from the vine, from the wine, and his teeth are whiter than milk. 
This is, of course, of course, one of the classic messianic prophecies. And so we know, I mean, even in the Jewish tradition, this is a messianic prophecy. I mean, they don't believe that it was Christ, obviously, but it's pretty well known as a messianic prophecy. What's the first thing that we're told is that the scepter, that his royal lineage is not going to depart from the house and tribe of Judah. Uh, The law will be explicated and enforced by a lawgiver in some way until Shiloh, until Messiah comes. And when he comes, he will be the expectation of the Gentiles. Again, one of the great key indicators that we've covered many, many times all throughout the Old Testament is that when the Messiah comes, the Gentiles will repent and turn to the God of Israel. Over and over and over in the Psalms, in the major prophets, in the minor prophets, over and over and over and over, and even back in Genesis. Early in Genesis, the prediction, not just here, but realize that Jacob, all Jacob's doing is summarizing what is in the Abrahamic covenant. The promise that when the Messiah comes, he would be the expectation. He would bless all the tribes and families and nations of the earth. And keep in mind, in in this time, and put your mindset in their mindset, I mean, this just seems crazy, right? It seems how in the world could God fulfill that? How could... A seed, somebody who's a seed of Abraham bless all the nations and turn these nations to the true God. How, how, that's crazy. That's never going to happen. These people, they worship, uh, you know, demons and sticks and rocks and butts. <laughs> right? And even Israel falls into worshiping holes at the... At, at, in numbers, Baal Peor, the Lord of open holes. And that is exactly what you think. That's exactly what it is. Yes, the ancient Crowleyan rites of butts, the butt liturgy. Now, a few verses later, this is uh, as J- uh, Joseph is uh, prophesying about each of the tribes of Israel, where, what their future will be. Now, these prophecies oftentimes have a double fulfillment. So in one sense, the historical fulfillment is clearly about the tribe of Judah here, that Judah will have a lineage. Judah will be the royal lineage. He's predicting the tribe of Judah would be the tribe that would be the royal lineage. That happened, right? We know that in the time of the kings, Right, David descends from this lineage. David is of the tribe of Judah. And we know that in the time of the kings, you have the division of the kingdom. Right, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, the sons of Solomon, have a, a schism within Israel. And you have the evil northern kings who are all bad. And then you have the southern tribe, which is the legitimate place of worship, the legitimate kings in the tribe of Judah, where the, t- the, the tabernacle and the temple are lawfully placed they uh, have a few, right? There's Josiah, there's David, but they have a lot of bad ones too. But Israel is really bad. I mean, the, Israel becomes the term for the northern tribes and the southern tribe, Judah, right? So what's amazing about this prophecy, first of all, is that there will be a royal lineage all the way until Messiah comes, implying that the scepter will depart after that. So you will know when the Messiah comes when there's no more Davidic kings. There are no more Davidic kings. There haven't been Davidic kings in 2,000 years. Okay. We're not, we're not here to talk about debate. We're not debating genetics in here. That's not what this topic's about. We're here to talk about old, the biblical theology. Okay. So we're not going to get into these debates about this stuff anyway this has nothing to do with Ashkenazi stuff we're not debating that so there's an interesting prophecy though after this which by the way let me add that uh, this shows you that God is not inherently opposed to monarchy because this is a prediction of a monarchy this is a prediction of a royal scepter and the royal lineage through David 
And so this dumb argument that people have by the time that we get to judges, oh, judges is a treatise against the monarch because they had, they had judges. The book says that because there's no king in Israel, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. It's an anti-judges treatise. The whole book of Judges is a treatise for monarchy. So it's just really kind of idiotic when people think that, oh, the Bible's against monarchy. No, it's not. Jesus is the king of kings, so it's not against monarchy. There are warnings, right? What does Samuel warn everybody? He says, if you ask for the king, he says it's going to be bad for you. Why is it going to be bad? He's going to take your daughters. He's going to take your H-O-E-S's, make them, make them H-O-E-S. Why? Because of the institution itself? No, because he says, you guys want a king after the nations. What did the pagans around Israel do? They worshipped their kings. They viewed their kings, their warrior lord, warlord kings, they viewed them as semi-divine or divine. All right? The ancient inscriptions of the coins uh, of Caesar, they call Caesar the son of God. The pagan kings always foisted themselves upon their masses as divine or semi-divine. Pharaoh is the apex between heaven and earth. That's why this, it's a pyramid, right? So if, you, if you're familiar with this, this is pretty common. So in ancient Egyptian metaphysics, this, is the, this world, this is the earth, it's a pyramid. At the top here is Pharaoh, and he is the meeting point the bridge between heaven and earth. And that's why he's at the top of the pyramid because he is the incarnate, you could say, raw. He's raw on earth in human incarnation. Not in a biblical sense. Not, he's not incarnate like son of God or something like that. In the Egyptian metaphysic, it's more like pantheism. Everything is God, but mm, not you. You're just like lower down on that pyramid <laughs> really it's pharaoh that's god not you right uh hold on a second i gotta erase this erase board all right so uh and by the way i've got uh you know in my ancient uh, metaphysics talks we cover that all that uh, egyptian metaphysics and whatnot you can go find those old talks uh they're they're pretty old they are time tested can find those so we have this prediction of when the messiah would be born and there will be signs that accompany it the signs would be that there would no longer be a royal house a royal lineage the gentiles will begin to convert and guess what this happened when did this happen when did the scepter depart from judah well in 70 a.d there was a very important event that happened and it was the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. So now we, we want to look at one of the key texts that shows us this. And we want to stress this because this is very important for vindicating the Bible. When we have dumb theology, when we are idiots... And get this wrong, we undermine our own view and our own coherency, our own worldview, our own proof texts. And I'm going to show you that this is the patristic view. I mean, maybe a lot of you don't know this, but this is a common mistake people make. They're going to stick everything in the future. And they're going to undermine and miss one of the key proofs of our, of our position. If you look at Luke 21, Jesus says, He looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw a certain poor widow putting in two mites. And he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all. For, out, for these, out of their abundance, have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty and all the livelihood that she had. Then some of them spoke of the temple and how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations. And he said, The things that you see, this temple 
The days will come in which not one stone will be left upon another that will not be torn down. And they asked him, teacher, when will this be? What will be the sign that these things are about to take place? Take heed, you, the people standing in front of him. This is a key, this is a big mistake, especially people who don't know how to interpret texts, who have not studied or taken any courses on hermeneutics. They'll say, oh, this is talking about the end of the world. Now, it does have an application to the end of time. It has an application to all throughout time, right? But we don't divorce it from the immediate uh, historic context. Right? This is called the grammatical historical, the literal level of interpretation. So at this basic level, which is what's going to build the rest of the hermeneutic layers on, we understand the immediate context and the immediate audience. Who is Jesus talking to here? It's not directly talking to me, right? I might have like evangelical uh, superpower feelings. Like, oh, it's talking to me, dude. Jesus was talking to me. That's pre list. Yes, he's talking to you in a general sense, but the Bible isn't written to you. Okay, that's like schizophrenia level stuff, right? That's why a lot of the people in the world think that religious people are wackos. The, the book's not talking to you, dude. Not in that way. So how do we understand how this applies to us? And again, I'm going to show you that everything I'm, I'm telling you is 100% in line with the teaching of the church fathers. This is not, I know this because I made all these dumb mistakes. I'm not saying I'm schizophrenic, <laughs> but I was raised evangelical. I was raised Protestant. I was like, oh, dude, just talking about the end of the world. Let me get my prophecy charts out. I'm going to chart all this out of the end of the world. and We're going to blow the shofar. <laughs> The trumpet judgments are coming, John Hagee. <laughs> Read my new book in defense of Israel. My name's John Hagee, and I've eaten 24 blood moons. 24 blood moons. <laughs> 24 moon pie blood moons. In defense of Israel. Jesus was not the Messiah. Yeah, I had to throw a John Hagee in there for you guys. I know you guys, everybody loves the John Hagee. What does it say? It says... Take heed that you be not deceived. Many will come in my name. They will say, I am he. The time is not yet drawn near. Do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, don't be terrified, for these things must come to pass first. The end will not come immediately. The end of what? End of the world? Not in the immediate context. The end of the world is not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about the temple. That's what they're talking about. You see this? I'm going to tell you when this temple is about to be ripped down. He says, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in many places, famines, pestilences, fearful signs, and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay hands on, persecute you, and they will deliver you to synagogues. Are we all being delivered up to synagogues? For the people who think that we're suddenly in the end, time, end times right now? No. But the disciples were delivered up, weren't they, in the book of Acts? Exactly. Guess what? Everything that Jesus just listed, there's examples of that in the books of Acts. There's earthquakes. There are famines and pestilences mentioned. Have you read Josephus? I have. Josephus was an eyewitness to the destruction of, temple, of the temple, and he mentions all these things. In fact, I wrote a graduate paper, now an undergraduate paper, and I'll put it here. Here is one of my undergraduate papers on this very topic. Go read that. Where I cite extensively from Josephus, the eyewitness to this stuff. Anyway, back to the text. It says, They will deliver you up to the synagogues and prisons, but you will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. There's not a whole lot of kings in the world today. Are we all going to be brought before the king of Monaco and per being persecuted? <laughs> so, I mean... <laughs> How many kings are there really, right? But it will turn out to you for an occasion for testimony. Well, guess what? That happens multiple times in the book of Acts, doesn't it? Paul before Felix, Paul before Agrippa. Yeah. Therefore, do not set it in your hearts to meditate beforehand what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and a wisdom that all your adversaries will not be able to resist. Acts 7, when St. Stephen, Jesus speaks directly through, prophesies through St. Stephen. I'm sorry, but John Hagee is not prophesying. Jesus is not speaking through John Hagee. 
You will be betrayed by your parents and brothers and relatives, and they will put you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your heads will be lost. By your patience, possess your souls. When you, you, immediate context, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that its destruction is near. How could it be any more clear than this? This is talking about what happened 40 years later. Jerusalem was surrounded by armies, and it was destroyed. Then let you, in the immediate context here, who are in Judea, flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. For those who are in the country, enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, in which all things written in the prophets are to be fulfilled. For woe to those who are pregnant and nursing in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. This is not talking about a global catastrophe. It's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Now, we know that at this time, and many of these people fled to Petra and places like this, right, to, to, because they were warned. Am I supposed to flee to Judea? Am I supposed to leave Tennessee and flee to Judea? Is this talking about all the Christians in the world supposed to flee to Judea? That's ridiculous. That's idiotic. Stop being idiotic. What else does he say? You better hope your journey is not on the Sabbath. We don't keep the Sabbath in the way that it was kept at this time. This is during the period when the Sabbath is still being kept. In the book of Acts, it's the transition period. 70 AD completes the transition period from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. It's not just Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. The book of Acts, uh, remember Pentecost? Isn't Pentecost part of the eschaton being brought into reality? Of course it is. Joel predicts in the last days, the spirit will be poured out upon all my people, handmaids as well. What is that talking about? Is that talking about the, the blood moons of Israel? It mentions the, the blood moon, doesn't it? But how does Acts interpret the book of Joel? Does it say that it's the end of the world and John Hagee's goofy church? No, it says that at Pentecost, in Acts 2, Joel is being fulfilled. Do you see that? What Joel is talking about is the exact same thing Jesus is talking about. Now, this is an interesting text here. He says, these people, some up in this nation that had rejected him, they will fall by the edge of the sword. They will be led away captive into all the nations. That's not talking about the end of the world. That happened 40 years later. The diaspora. Don't you know basic history? No, evangelicals don't know basic history. And by the way, a lot of Protestants and Orthodox get this wrong as well. And we're going to see the church fathers rebuking many uh, Protestant Orthodox and Catholics on this topic. In fact, I'm going to even show you in Catholic teaching catholic liturgy talks about preterism but you didn't know that did you and i found it in a trad work i couldn't believe it an old trad missile actually mentions preterism it's amazing anyway rare find rare gems nobody else has ever noticed this or talked about this uh jerusalem will be trampled by the gentiles until the times of the gentiles are fulfilled now, even the evangelicals in their own wrong, goofy interpretation of this can't make sense of that text because they put that at the end of the world. So Jerusalem is going to be trampled by Gentiles for, what, three and a half years? But he just said that the Jews are going to be led captive into all the other nations. That's not talking about the end of the world. That's what happened 40 years later after he said this. Now, I'm gonna, there's many, many more texts we're going to look at, but you understand the import of this. If you move all this to the future, all unfulfilled, the force of all of this argumentation, the force of the reality that was brought at the first advent is gone. The church is no longer the actuality of heaven on earth. It's some eschatological thing at the end of time that's not here now. We're still waiting on all this stuff, right? 
oh, it's a dispensation of a different plan B. No, there's no plan B. Christ is the fulfillment of all the covenants. In him, every promise of God is yea, Paul says. It's not some postponed thing. That's crazy talk. Nobody believed that dumb heresy until 100 years ago. Looking for my other Bible because I've got some interesting notes in there. Now, as we read on cosmic signs, Josephus describes all these cosmic signs. What do you mean there were no cosmic signs in the first century, Mr. Evangelical? Yes, there were. Josephus describes them. He was an eyewitness. The powers of heaven will be shaken. We was the powers of heaven shaken in the first century. Do you know what it means when the prophets use the term the powers of heaven will be shaken? In Isaiah 9, I think it's 19 off the top of my head, there's a text where it says God will, will come into Egypt and destroy Egypt, Isaiah prophesies. God will return. He will come. The, the powers of heaven will be shaken. He said it would be like the luminaries will fall. That means the rulers. Luminaries represent rulers. It doesn't always mean literally the sun and the moon fall down and everything's destroyed. Now, at the end of the world, there will be a renovation of the entire creation. Yes, but that's not what this is talking about. Did, Christ, did God return in Isaiah 19 to Egypt when he uses the exact same phraseology and language? of Luke 21? No, of course not. Did the whole was all of heaven destroyed in Isaiah 19? No. And that's talking about a prophecy in Isaiah's day against Egypt. So people get confused and they get muddled and they don't know what they're talking about because they don't actually know their Bible from cover to cover, right? So one of the advantages of being immersed in Protestantism for ever and ever and ever <laughs> is that you do get to know your Bible if you take it seriously, right? And then you you if you, you weed out a lot of these mistakes. And then you go and you read the church fathers and you realize they had it, they had it right the whole time. <laughs> like you could have just, you know, gone to them anyway. But I'm going to show you that, that uh, interestingly, most of the Eastern fathers, the, the important Eastern fathers, they actually were preterists. They got this right. Uh, why um, this wasn't as common in the Latin West, I'm not sure. Uh, that, that could be attributed to many reasons. Who knows? But uh, we know that the Eastern church, the Eastern fathers were consistent. They got it right. I'm even going to show you modern monastic works, right, that talk about preterism. Anyway, now we're not full preterists. That's heresy. Uh, full preterism is utterly, totally unorthodox. Right? Can't believe that all the resurrection and everything is already fulfilled. That's crazy. Anyway, uh, let's see. So this comes up all the time in in our Discord. Is part of the reason I'm doing this is to have something to refer to so I don't have to keep giving this talk over and over and over because I've given this explanation about 20 times in Discord. So uh, then he goes on to talk about the fig tree. The fig tree always represents Israel. Israel is withering, right? It's, it's a worthless fig tree. Um, it hasn't produced the fruit that it's supposed to. I got dusty books out, so I'm going to start sneezing again. And another one of the key uh, texts that we want to know for this. So Luke is, is good because in Luke 21, it's actually a little clearer than Matthew 24. They're both the uh, all of that discourse, obviously, right? But if you go back to Matthew 23, right before Matthew 24, which is Matthew's version of what's in Luke 21, Jesus says he's talking about the fate of Israel. It's the same context. He says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who stones the prophets and those sent to you, how I would have gathered you together as children, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you were not willing. Your house is left to you desolate. This is a prediction of 70 AD. That's what it's talking. It's talking about 70 AD. Your house is left to you desolate. What do you think it means? Desolation. What's the abomination of desolation? What is it? Well, this, that whole chapter of 23 is a rebuke to that generation. The generation of his day that rejected him. That whole chapter is a rebuke of that generation. And that generation is what's going to undergo 70 AD, which is the culmination of all of the covenant curses. All those predictions of covenant curses are going to be exacted upon that generation. From the murder of Abel to the murder of Zechariah between the altar all of that will come in culmination 
as the measure of their iniquity fills up upon that generation of Jesus' day because they rejected the Son of God. So when we understand that, we begin to understand, now wait a minute, the fall of Jerusalem originally to the Babylonians, right, in 586, that fall is, is emblematic of the future falls. And I'm going to show you that this was true even in the Old Testament. This is not some made-up Christian hermeneutic. This was true even back then. So we're all familiar with, if you get to the end of the books of the kings, right, that's when Israel falls and they're taken captive. Uh, both, first the northern tribe falls, I think, to the Syrians, and then uh, the southern tribe falls, Babylonians, right? And they're led into captivity. And then they have this, the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. So the prophets will speak of this period of captivity. And of course, Daniel is one of the most important for this time of captivity. And that's why when we see Daniel 2, we notice that he gives a prediction of successive world empires. Uh, the first imagery that describes the success of world empires is the giant idol of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Everybody's familiar with, hopefully, the story of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Uh, and it predicts the success of world empires, the uh, Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Greeks, and Romans. Later on, we have in Daniel another dream, another vision. And Daniel sees beasts. Right, now, this is later on in 11. But before we get to Daniel 11, there's, in Daniel 9, there's a prediction, famous prediction of the 70 weeks. I'm not going to get into this, the minutia because we would be here all night. And it's, it's a lot of debated stuff. Let's stick to what's obvious. And what's obvious is that if you have the Orthodox Bible and the canon of Scripture according to the Orthodox Church, and if you notice the notes on Daniel 9, what's the first text that's mentioned there? The Epistle of Barnabas, one of the early patristic writings. Not in the canon of Scripture, but it's very early. Chapter 16 observes that this chapter, Daniel 9, 24-27, is fulfilled when the temple and the sanctuary were destroyed in 70 AD. The Orthodox Study Bible has it right here. Yes, preterism. Barnabas also points out that the true temple is the body of Christ. That's why Jesus says, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it again in three days. Spiritual temple is his body, by extension the church as well. Thus the 70 weeks here is meant 70 weeks of years, 490 years, 70 times 7. The prophecy applies to Jeremiah's 70 years. This is why Daniel in the book says, I figured this out by reading Jeremiah. Patterns. So unless you wanted to reject Daniel from Scripture, Daniel in the Old Testament is admitting the pattern and recurring pattern principle of hermeneutics in the Old Testament itself. This is because people who oppose our position, they say, oh, that's not, you're violating. That's not improper hermeneutic. You can't just, you can't take a prediction in the Old Testament and make Patterned applications of, oh, really? Well, Daniel does. St. Hippolytus says this is about the coming of the Messiah. St. Hippolytus gives this a preterist interpretation. The epistle of Barnabas gives this a preterist interpretation. This is not talking about the end of the world. And guess what? If Daniel 9 is preterist according to these father, then Matthew 24 and Luke 21 are also preterist because they're talking about the same event. Why do I know that? What does it say? The prophecy says, after 62 weeks, all right, Messiah the Prince is who's predicted here. I think everybody knows clearly that's the Messiah, right? Although some of the goofy evangelicals think Messiah the Prince is the Antichrist, which is utterly ridiculous, but... After 60 weeks, the anointed one would be put to death. Right? That's, the, that's the death of Christ. Come on here. 
Let's, let's stop being stupid, okay? There will be a judgment for him. There will be no upright judge for him. He, he will destroy the city, city and the sanctuary with the prince who is coming. Titus, the Roman warrior, is who destroyed Jerusalem. Jesus says, do you remember the parable of the vine dressers? He says, what will happen to the vine dressers when the king comes back? He will bring his armies and he will destroy those wicked people. Matthew 22, Jesus says, this is what's going to happen in 70 AD. Do you understand that this is why 70 AD is so important? It's the end. It's the culmination of the end of the Mosaic economy. And by extension, the entire Old Testament economy. They shall appoint the city for desolations. This is the abomination of desolation. Then he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of the week, the sacrifice and the drink offering will be taken away. And there will be in the temple the abomination of desolation. And at the end of time, and at the end of the time, excuse me, an end to the desolation shall be appointed. Uh, let's go back a little bit because it actually starts in... I read 26, skip up to 24. 70 weeks are determined for your people, for the holy city, to make an end to sins. This is the measure of the sins of these people. Jesus says all of the culmination of the sins will come upon this generation. From righteous Abel to Zechariah. This generation, and thus all things written in the prophets will be fulfilled, Jesus says. To the generation standing in front of him. Once you, read, once you know this and then you read through the Gospels, this is so obvious. Of course that's who he's talking about. He's not talking about John Hagee and the end of the world crap. He's talking about the generation standing in front of him. I'm not saying there's no application to the end of the world. We'll get to that. Know, and therefore, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the word to be answered and the, to build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be 72 weeks. Excuse me, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Then he will return and the streets and the wall will be rebuilt and the time will be left desolate. And after 62 weeks, the anointed one will be put to death. So it's finishing iniquity. It's also to atone for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to end and seal up the visions and the prophecies and to anoint the Holy of Holies. <laughs> this is all what Jesus did. Jesus brings eternal righteousness. Jesus atones for sin. Jesus ends the old covenant economy. Just read the book of Hebrews. The, whole, the book of Hebrews is about this. It proves this. The whole book is saying that Christ has brought the reality. We don't need temples. We don't need animal sacrifices. We don't need those old mosaic administration implements anymore because they're fulfilled in Christ and in the church. The church is the continuation of Israel. Once you have this mindset, this becomes a very powerful prediction and prophecy. And you'll note in the text, in uh, the note uh, 24 through 27, that there is a helpful, because we have deuterocanonical second Esdras, right? We have Esdras, Nehemiah, right? Second Esdras that if we want to date it roughly uh, in what's mentioned in 2nd Ezra 7, 7 and 8, then we, under Artaxerxes, then we have a good case for the actual specific dating. Now, that's debated. That's fine. I, I'm not that interested in the exact pinpoint because even if you don't have that view, this is still believed to be written before Rome. So unless you have some view that I'm not aware of that Daniel wrote after the Roman Empire, which I've never heard anybody propose that, this is talking about successive world empires. This is talking about, and I don't, this isn't even debated, like the four successive empires from, he's dating it from the time of Daniel, I mean, uh, the Babylonian captivity, so Babylon. Medo-Persians, right? Darius, Cyrus, that stuff, right? Remember that in Isaiah and Daniel. Uh, the Greeks, when we have Alexander and Antiochus Epiphanes, and
and then Rome. And I don't think anybody down. Now, think of the stupidity of taking these empires and then taking the last empire under which the Messiah will be born, according to Daniel, and saying that that's the EU, like these goofy evangelicals. Think how stupid that is. It's not the EU. That destroys the whole prophecy of Jesus being born under the fourth empire, after the Greeks. That's Rome. Jesus is born under the Roman Empire. The Gospels make it a point to say that, to show that it's fulfilling what Daniel predicted. Now, things get difficult. Yes, they are hairy. They're difficult when we come to the sections in Daniel 10 and 11 about the angelic visitor, in particular chapter 11, which appears to be about the Maccabees. Right, because it talks about Antiochus, it talks about the Greeks, so it's predicting. Um, and it mentions in Daniel 11 the abomination of desolation. How do we solve this? Well, guess what? If you have the view that I just told you of mirrored events, you know exactly how to solve this. Because if you read Maccabees, then you know that there's a desolation that occurs under the Maccabees. And not just under the Maccabees. It happens in 3rd Maccabees under Ptolemy. So there's not just one abomination of desolation. The temple gets desecrated. There's an abomination, abomination that makes for desolations more than once. Now, how do I know that? Ultimately, because Jesus cites Daniel. Jesus cites Daniel's abomination of desolation. And what's Jesus talking about? We all know he's talking about 70 AD. We know that's what he's talking about. When the Romans come in, they desecrate the temple, just like the Babylonians had back in 586 BC, just like Antiochus does, the Greek, one of Alexander's underlings. He sacrifices a pig on the altar. Antiochus does. That's what makes the Maccabees so furious. They... Uh, he desecrates the temple. He's a type of antichrist. He's a satanically inspired individual who is mocking God by that action. Have you not read Maccabees? That's what the whole book's about. It occurs again. Ptolemy. Ptolemy is a Egyptian ruler. And in 3rd Maccabees, there's another type of this event. By the way, Jeremiah predicts these same events, right? Jeremiah speaks of the abomination of desolation in Jeremiah 4. This is the proof for my view. And it's not my view. I just got this from what the prophets themselves did in terms of hermeneutics. I didn't invent this. And it's the way that the church fathers apply this text, right? So if you read Jeremiah 4, we did a whole lecture on Jeremiah. Go listen to that. You will see the uh, same four animals of Daniel. When Daniel says, I read Jeremiah to get my hermeneutic in this pattern, he's not doing anything different than what Jeremiah did. Jeremiah has the same animals, the same beasts. Now that we understand this, it's that easy, right? And by the way, when you read into, let's see, Jeremiah, this continues. The curses upon the people. All you have to do is understand that it's a recurring pattern. It's that easy. And the key, the key to this is the Maccabees. It's Jeremiah 8, by the way. So what, what, what I'm saying here is that this term, abomination that makes for desolation, or the abomination of desolation, is when the altar is defiled, when a pagan ruler comes in and defiles the altar, it happens in 586 B.C. with the Babylonian captivity. Uh, this is uh, predicted in Jeremiah 36 and 37, right? This is what Daniel's talking about when he says, I was reading Jeremiah to figure all this out. He says, and I prayed and Gabriel came and explained all this to me. So, Daniel, prophesying under the captivity, you see, he's after Jeremiah. 
He says, I went back and I read the scrolls of Jeremiah. God enlightened me. Gabriel came, explained me the Gabriel hermeneutic, which is the right hermeneutic. And then I saw what was going on. I saw the coming world empires, the same ones that Jeremiah predicted, same beasts. You understand that? It's the same animals. Now, how dumb is it? How dumb? And, and undermining of our whole thing to take the fourth beast, rip it out of the fulfillment of the Roman Empire and the birth of the Messiah and apply this to some stupid EU stuff. But the EU has a poster with the Tower of Bible on it. Yeah, I know that. But so what? We don't do hermeneutics by posters and reading that back into the Bible. That's retarded. Totally stupid. You just destroyed the, one of the strongest proofs for the religion by doing that. You idiot. And by the way, what was I just reading? The catechetical lectures of some people get mad. You, you're so mean to people. You could. The catechetical lectures of St. Cyril, have you read those? No, you haven't. But if you do, look at the way he talks about people who are heretics. <laughs> like he's, he's the most intense I've, I've seen. Like St. Cyril, he just like, he's like, you're demonic. You're the mouths of heretics. Uh, you're the, you're mouth, the mouths of heretics are the gates of hell. Uh, he says they're fools, they're idiots, they're every name in the book. He has no problem in his catechesis. Cat, did you hear that? He's teaching catechumens, and he calls the heretics a bunch of idiots. Fools, demons. Me calling them retardo is being nice compared to the way St. Cyril speaks of them in the catechetical lecture. So anyway... Um, so th this, I think, is the solution to this Maccabees. Uh, and there is, it's in, it's right away, right? First Maccabees, first few chapters is the abomination there. This is what sparks the Maccabees to revolt. Uh, and then, yeah. So the abomination of desolation. Now, this is after Daniel, you see. So I'm going to prove this. If we open up 2nd, well, it's mentioned in 2nd Maccabees too, but let's go to 1st Maccabees. And we'll see that this Antichrist move is an attempt to stamp out the Messiah. Why are they doing this? Why do these pagan emperors even care? Well, we know that it's actually inspired by Satan, who back in Genesis 3 was told that the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. So he knows that from this lineage, somebody's coming that's going to be a problem for him. Now, he doesn't know everything. He doesn't, he's not omniscient, so he doesn't have the full picture. But he knows that he needs to get rid of this group, this people group. This is why the Jews are constantly persecuted in the Old Testament. Uh, and so in... First uh, Maccabees chapter 1, we have the uh, abomination of desolation, verse 54. They set up the abomination of desolation and the altar, the whole burnt offering, and brought the uh, altars in the sur surrounding cities of Jus Jerusalem, of Judah. They burned incense at the door, found the book of the law, burned them, they burned up the book, they found the book of the covenant, blah, 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 and it says... They wanted to kill everybody. They acted against Israel. Okay. So why do they want to kill everybody? Because the Messiah is going to be born of those people. Right? Now, Antiochus Epiphanes is not that intelligent. He doesn't know what's going on. Right? Antiochus pillages the temple. He's just a, a possessed idiot. Right? But behind him is that satanic spirit. Same spirit behind the Babylonian captivity. So then we have the, the story of the Maccabees, right? And then the abomination uh, comes up again uh, in 6, where they, uh, Antiochus IV is about to die. Uh, the abomination is still there, the idol, uh, on top of the temple, or the altar, excuse me. And so Judas Maccabeus turns it up, tears it down. Is it Judas? Somebody tears it down. They pull down the abomination. Um, 
They do imprecatory prayers, by the way. Uh, we have the mention of Rome beginning to rise. Uh, and this fulfills Daniel's, in chapter 8, this fulfills Daniel's prediction of the fourth beast, the, big, the bottom of, the, uh, of Nebuchadnezzar's image, right? The, the feet of the image. Uh, in chapter 9 of First Maccabees, the, right, the, they keep trying to destroy the temple. They keep trying to destroy it. Uh, abomination is... Okay, so in chapter 12 of Maccabees... We have... I have a note here. I don't understand my note. I don't know. You can read chapter 12, but once again, you'll see that this is a mirroring. The abomination is mirrored in 70 AD, according to Luke 21. Um, but that's not all. Now, keep in mind, if you're evangelical, you don't have Maccabees. You don't have this key insight of seeing that Daniel 9 is mirrored. Now, Maybe you could derive it just from reading Jeremiah and Daniel. That's plausible. But I think this is a key insight because, let's see, if we move to 2 Maccabees, I think I think it comes up again. Abomination comes up again in 2 Maccabees 5. Yes. Once again, the uh, the attempt is to stamp out this race of people, and to do so, they want to destroy the worship of this race of people. You see, that's why this is so key. Yes. And then in chapter six, Second Maccabees six, you have the persecution, Athens versus Jerusalem here, and they try to destroy the temple. Uh, polluted again they put up an image of Zeus Zeus the hospitable uh, and they want the Jews to stop following the law of God now again why do they want to destroy this race of people now all the pagan LARPers are like, because of what the Jews are bad no it's because they're bringing the Messiah that's who and Satan doesn't know he might have known the Davidic prophecies but he doesn't know how this is going to all go down right he just knows if he can stamp out this race this people which is what Pharaoh tried to do and who else all these rulers try to do in Maccabees and what Herod tries to do right remember when Herod does this Herod does the exact same thing as Pharaoh Now, the, again, to prove the repeating pattern view, there's a yet another character in 3rd Maccabees, another abomination of desolation in 3rd Maccabees, the character of Ptolemy. Ptolemy, yet another type of Antichrist. 3rd uh, Maccabees, chapter 2. Here, this is this one's fascinating because Ptolemy seems to be an even clearer type of Antichrist than Antiochus was. Because what does it say in the note here at the end of two? He tries to mark everybody with his Dionysian pagan mystery religion mark. Right? Look at uh, two. 228 and 29 and the notes in the Orthodox study Bible are really good because they point out Ptolemy registered those uh, those registered are those who, who willingly comply. They were branded with a mark of allegiance that will be permanent. Some people in ancient times would brand themselves as a symbol of their God. Here it is the ivy leaf. St. John predicts a similar mark when Antichrist comes. Revelation 13, 16, 17. Uh, and the note on 28 said, battle lines are drawn here for an unseen spiritual warfare. The Jews must not, must worship, must not worship their God by the dictate of Ptolemy. 
and everyone in Alexandria must sacrifice to uh, the god Dionysius. The census of, is of the slaves and the servant classes, seemingly unique to Alexandria. The Jews are effectively becoming the property of the state, so we have like statism. This is the beast, right? The, the beast is the state proclaiming itself God, and in the apocalypse, of course, it has a religion that goes along with it, the false prophet, right? But the beast is the state. It's a state power who uh, has along with it a false prophet, the whore, the hoe, which is the false religion. But I just want to point out that uh, Third Maccabees and Ptolemy with his uh, mark, imagine that, a, a whole other type and pattern, recurring pattern of an antichrist figure who tries to mark everybody so that they can have commerce and all that and live in the world, right? And if you don't have Maccabees, and by the way, Orthodox have Third Maccabees. You see, so yet another proof that we have, another testament to the, to our view that the other people don't have. All right, let me pour a little more coffee because it's it's late, and we're having a late night theology stream with wow, 450 people. I didn't know this many people would be interested in first, second, third Maccabees and Old Testament predictions. Now, if you would smash like, give me that like, and I much appreciate that. And let me pour a little coffee, listen to a little bit of that sweet amid the ruins dire wave. Give me about 30 seconds. Don't run off. Don't run off. I'll be right back. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to see you all here. We got a room of almost 200 nerds. And I'm sure the nerds will pile in. Maybe we can get up to about 300 tonight. We'll see. It's your boy. Jay in the house, your boy, can't see me. some more fire water by that I mean coffee I don't mean spirits I don't drink it's weird how I never have a desire to drink at all ever I used to love alcohol in my 20s I drank all the time and thankfully I mean yeah I mean I wasn't like a super drunk but I did drink too much and then it just went away crazy no desire was I, I don't ever I just it's just I don't know it's a weird thing wish I could be I'd be delivered by from my other vices so easily <laughs> like a, get rid of the other the other ones are a little harder right it's like the other ones are quitting quitting alcohol quitting smoking cigarettes those are easy compared to the other vices you know what I mean like pride and that kind of stuff all right, uh, let's see. What was I going to do next? We talked about the beasts, Third Maccabees. Okay, so let's look at uh, some of the texts. Now, I believe that the um, the apocalypse follows the structure roughly of the Olivet Discourse. So I do think they're talking about the same event. Um, the best case in my view, uh, you have another video. I'm not going to go on to the antichrist character itself, but if you want to watch my video on antichrist, just try J Dyer antichrist into YouTube and you'll get my, it's had about 10,000 views. Uh, I spent about 40 minutes kind of outlining my view of antichrist. Nero is the immediate context. Now I don't believe that, uh, it's only Nero, right? It's not, everything's not fulfilled in the first century. That, that's crazy. 
Uh, that's a heresy. There are people who are full preterists. Uh, I do believe that is a heresy. It's completely out of accord with the entire history of Orthodox Christianity, <laughs> the bodily resurrection, all of that. Um, so, no, we don't believe full preterism. So what's the solution? Well, let's start with the monastic text. That is a good one to, to read. Now, unfortunately, this is out of print. I've, I've mentioned it many times. Um, at Ortho Christian, there is a summary article. There's an article that's uh, he printed out. It's about 10 pages. And it's a summary of this booklet, which is like 50 pages, roughly. Um, but there's a great text in here that kind of lays out my view. So I was actually surprised when I read this. So I thought, oh, they're not going to mention preterism. It's going to be, it's going to be all these speculations. And it's not. It's, it, it, this is not bad. It's actually mainly just what the church fathers say. So it, it's not too much speculation. Um, pretty good overall. I would say that this this book is pretty accurate. Probably how things are going to go down. I'm not saying we're in the end times, so we're not going there. I'm just trying to give you guys caution here. This is what we're trying to do. We want the accurate view. We don't want to go into sensationalism and speculations. So the Holy Fathers of the Church explain how all these words about uh, Matthew 24 or Luke 21 um, are a prototype. Excuse me, let me go back. The Holy Fathers of the Church explain that these words, the glad tidings of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a witness to all the nations and then the end comes. This points to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD as a prototype of the future. Greater tribulations will come when the fury of this prophecy is fulfilled at the end of time. The fall of Jerusalem is symbolic of the end of the world. Terrible though it was, it was only a shadow of what is to come upon mankind at the end. Yes, so we want to notice that that is our pattern of hermeneutics here. Uh, they go on to note, uh, in, a, in addition, many believers begin will, will follow after many forerunners to Antichrist. Okay, so they will mention, it mentions that there are many Antichrists. Uh, and so then it goes into many of the church fathers, right, talking about what to expect, uh, one world religion type thing eventually. Uh, mass apostasy in the church, as Paul predicts at one at some point. Not saying that we, right now this is the mass apostasy. Could be we may we may be getting there. But here's the key thing. The other thing I wanted to mention from this text, which is that uh, one of the elders, I think I marked it on one of the, one of the saints. I think it's the saints. Anyway, they make the point that we don't have to worry about that. Okay, we're not goofy evangelicals who sit around trying to make big prophecy charts all day to figure out when the end of the world and rapture is all that nonsense the closer that we get to the end the saints say the clearer it will be so we don't have to worry about that we don't have to worry about news headlines and trying to is john when he talks about the scorpions is that a helicopter with a nuke attached to it this no we don't have to worry about that and i don't think john's talking about helicopters with nukes by the way <laughs> um the saints are clear that as the time gets closer that we will know it's it's going to be obvious okay it's not going to be like nobody's going to know except five people in a monastery somewhere i mean it will be obvious <laughs> when we see these things coming to pass right so that we can be, I mean, it'll be obvious to us in the church, I'm saying. It's not going to be obvious to everybody because a lot of people are going to fall for all this deception and nonsense, right? But to those in the church, it will be obvious because they will know these pretty clear signs. And this, go, this book goes into mentioning, you know, all of what the church fathers speak of as the, the key signs. Uh you know, things like there will be a one world religion that will be enforced. It will be the same as the ancient pagan mystery religions. There will be a world government. There will be an antichrist figure. There will be a uh, false religion that is promoted. And then the antichrist casts that off and says, you have to worship me now. Ha ha ha, tricked you. That false religion wasn't the real deal. You worship me or, you know, you can't do anything. Uh, mass apostasy, the church in whole, 
apostatizes. And as you've heard me say many times, the church fathers teach this. You don't like this. It's not my fault. It's what the church teaches. It's what Paul teaches. And it is true. This will occur whether you believe it or not. And that means that you can't say that there are no more Jews. That's dumb. Now, I'm not saying that that means that evangelical stuff's right. It's not. John Hagee's not right. But it's also not right what all these idiot LARPers and trads think that there are no more Jews. That's dumb. That's not true. That's not the patristic view. How can the church fathers say that the Jews will be converted if there's no more Jews? Duh. That's dumb. How can there be Jews being mentioned for centuries in the church, the church's canons, if Jews don't exist after the first? That's ridiculous. What are you talking about? Total ignorance of church history. I know what the Talmud says. I know all that stuff, right? So don't bring me that because it doesn't matter because the church, the New Testament teaches that eventually there will be a conversion. Now, I've changed my view on the Enoch and Elijah thing. I used to think the Enoch and Elijah thing was purely in the first century, and it was, I don't know, some prophet uh, prophesying between 30 to 70 AD in Israel. You know, who knows? Uh, in the spirit of Enoch and Elijah. But I actually think that probably Enoch and Elijah will have to return. I mean, that's the only way that people would actually believe, right? I mean, it would take something that wild for, you know, people in Israel to convert. That's my suspicion. But there's a whole chapter on Enoch and Elijah here. Most of our saints think that that will probably occur. Um, now, it does mention the attempt to cease the liturgy. I would not jump on, I mean, because all the world's liturgies haven't ceased. Okay, so I wouldn't jump on Karanka on all this stuff. Oh, it's the end of the world because of Karanka. Not yet. I mean, we, there's a lot of other things that we haven't seen yet that are going to be clear as the end of the world. Okay, so let's. We're not jumping to end of the world yet. I mean, Karanka, Karanka is fake and hey. Uh, so, I mean, is that really like an end times plague? Come on, no, it's not. That's crazy. <laughs> like the end times plagues don't sound fake and gay. They sound real. <laughs> um, so. Anyway, we're not going to do a whole lecture on uh, uh, apostles, but uh, I do recommend this uh, treatise. I think it's really good from Holy Transfiguration Monastery because it's just it's just a collection of what the Church Father said. That's all it is. It's not even it's not really any speculations going on in there. But it's good because it mentions the importance of preterism. Okay, so first let's look at. Not basil. Okay, so Athanasius. Athanasius uh, has multiple texts where he speaks of the partial preterist view. And because I have read significant almost all of this volume, or a large portion of this volume, um, I can tell you, okay, so... On the Incarnation, 112 is applied to Christ in the first advent. Uh, Daniel 9, as you've heard me explicating it, is uh, read of the first advent and on the Incarnation, 39 and 40. There is still a second advent to come, however, so he's not a full preterist. On the Incarnation, 156. Letter 60, section 7, speaks of preterism and 70 A.D., can't even read my notes something old testament fulfilled festal letter four four and five festal letter one seven and eight speaks of 70 a.d now those are just the ones i've, I've noticed there's more there's more so there are some preterist texts in athanasius if you want to write those down Catechetical Lectures of St. Cyril of Jerusalem that I mentioned, which I read all these 10 years ago. I took copious notes on the Catechetical Lectures. Where is the... 
Where's the printer stick? So I've got a print I'm a note for the yeah, here it is. Now he interestingly does what I do with Isaiah. So if you read catechetical lecture 16, 18, and 19, that is applied to the first advent. 70 AD, Isaiah 1 8. By the way, you can just look these up really quickly. Uh, they're all online. New Advent. You can look up the Catechetical Lectures. Okay, so that's at least one from St. Cyril. Okay, so uh, one of the best, of course, uh, Chrysostom on uh, Matthew. Matthew 24. Homily... Uh, 5075 on Matthew 24. Uh, 70 AD, he says, is the immediate context, the wars of Jerusalem. And he says, but that is a uh, type of the end of the world. Again, uh, St. John Chrysostom, homily 75 on Matthew 24. The whole homily is all about preterism. Do you know how many people I've had tell me the church fathers don't teach you? Uh, epistle, is it? Did I already mention the epistle? Bar yeah, I mentioned the epistle of Barnabas, didn't I? Yeah. Eusebius, uh, famous church history. Uh, Eusebius, chapter 7, book 3, chapter 7, the predictions of Christ. Well, guess what? Abomination of Desolation. Josephus, chapter 8. The signs. 70 AD. Destruction of the temple. Now, there is one that I uh, remember. Some, uh, John Damascus mentions it somewhere. Um, anyway, but if you go back and listen to my lectures in John Damascus on the exposition of Orthodox faith, I mention it in the, in those lectures. Now that's just ones that I've noticed. Uh, there's more, but oh man, the Eastern Fathers are a lot more. Now Hippolytus is is a Latin father, right? But typically the Eastern Fathers are clearer on this. Now, just as an interesting side note, because the Trads are almost never preterist. I don't know why, but. The trads are like, they don't get this. But in the old St. Andrew Missal from my trad days. Yes, yeah, see, see, here's proof trad. See how worn this is? It's actually worn out. The gold leaf leafing is all worn out because I actually did take my tradism seriously. And I actually did go to the Latin mass for many, many years. It's not fake. It's all, it's all true. It's not made up. There is a lengthy note on preterism. Where is it? I remember it from my tribe days. Got it marked somewhere. I think it's one of the readings for like Easter or something. Here it is. Found it. So in the traditional Latin Missal, the 24th and last Sunday after Pentecost, your missile notes. This, dude, this text is so small. I can't even read it. Look at this text. It's like, how do you read that? Look at that. Anyway, here you can see I'm not making it up. If you want to screenshot that and read it later, get it in that HD 1080p. It says, the Assyrians have destroyed Samaria and the uh, Chaldeans have laid waste to Jerusalem, but all this desolation will be repaired by the Messiah when he comes. Uh, Micah goes on to foretell that Christ will be born in uh, Bethlehem and his kingdom, that of the heavenly Jerusalem, will have no end. The prophets Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, whose books are read in the divine office the same week, their testimony to uh, 
to that of Micah in our Lord's first words in today's gospel. He quotes Daniel's prophecy of the total and final ruin of the temple at Jerusalem and of the Jewish nation at the hands of the Roman army. This abomination of desolation being incurred by the people of Israel for rejecting Christ. As a matter of fact, this prediction was fulfilled some years after the Lord's death. Exactly. In 70 AD. This destruction of the temple is a type of the end of the world. And then it goes on to basically repeat this. I had to stand up because I can barely read this tiny, tiny print. So there you go. Even the Latin Missal teaches preterism. Go chew on that, Treads. All right, so now we brought this up many times, but I always have to bring it up. People say, oh, what am I supposed to read on this? So if you want an introduction book to this topic, I would say uh, this is a good one, The Great Tribulation by David Chilton. Chilton came close to orthodoxy in his latter days. I don't think he ever officially converted. Uh, and there is a new one out. I haven't read. I think Lightheart has a, a commentary on the apocalypse that's good. I, I haven't read it, so I'm not going to recommend it. But this is a classic, so if you, if you can get your hands on David Chilton's uh, Days of Vengeance, they're both good. And also the hermeneutic at work here uh, that is based on the, the church fathers. Um, if there was one good book on hermeneutics, I would recommend it from an orthodox perspective. But, I mean, you could read Maximus or something like that because he'll tell you the, you know, the four layers of the scripture. That's pretty common by the late Middle Ages. All the East and West have the, the four senses of scripture. But if you are coming from a Protestant mindset, maybe you want a, a more biblical introduction to the topic of hermeneutics. Uh, James Jordan basically borrowed the church father's hermeneutic and uh, put it into a book. Of course, you can skip his Protestant stuff and just go right into orthodoxy. But Through New Eyes is a good book. It is a good sp- spirit of the patristic hermeneutic Um uh, He's kind of a quasi-Anglican, I guess, now nowadays. Anyway, so those are good uh, intro-level stuff. There's uh, there's more, obviously, to be said. but uh, And there's many more Church Fathers texts on Preterism, too. I'm just giving you a sample. Um, how long have we gone? Hour and a half? It's pretty good. So a few last points on Antichrist. I mean, so uh, my view, yes, I think that um, what we saw occur in these patterns of people okay pharaoh type of antichrist judas type of antichrist ptolemy third maccabees type of antichrist antiochus epiphanes type of antichrist nebuchadnezzar type of antichrist because right, nebuchadnezzar sets up this giant idol and says you have to worship it or you die um nero if you read gentry's book before Jerusalem fell, his THD thesis, I think, proves Nero is the Antichrist of the first century. That's what the book of the Apocalypse's immediate context is. That's why John says at the beginning of the Apocalypse that what I'm writing to the seven churches of Asia Minor, they are going to experience quickly. So, yeah, there's a full, there's a final uh, fulfillment. Apocalypse 19, right? The great white throne judgment. The return of of Christ. The millennial uh, reign. The millennial reign is something that began the first advent. It's not a thousand years of eating giant grapes and moving to Palestine. It's, It's a spiritual kingdom that was established that is the church. The church is the millennial reign. Those who are baptized participate in the first resurrection. Uh, and then the new heavens and the new earth in the orthodox view is the renovation of this world, this universe, right? This universe is renovated. It's transfigured. When Christ became incarnate, the purpose of that was to restore what Adam had lost. This in the patristic teaching is what's called the recapitulation. Now this, uh, unfortunately, this doctrine is lost in the West. After the time of Augustine, nobody knows, has any idea what re- recapitulation is. It is fundamental, however, to Orthodox theology from Irenaeus 
all the way up through to John Damascus, there is a recapitulation where Christ restores what Adam lost. And that being the nature, right? Nature is restored. That doesn't mean everybody's saved, though, because the way that you in hypostatize nature and use, utilize your will is going to determine whether it's ever ill being or ever well being in the eschaton. That's basic St. Maximus teaching right there. But the nature itself is going to be restored, and that's why all men are resurrected. That's why even the wicked are resurrected, because of Christ restoring their nature. But having your nature restored does not mean that you get a automatically pleasurable experience of the eschaton. Right? Nature can be restored, but the experience of nature depends on the tropos, the mode in which nature exists, which is in the mode of persons. So individual hypostases will have a different experience depending upon how they utilize their natural will for virtue or for vice, according to St. Maximus. And by extension, according to John Damascus, who follows St. Maximus to the T. Now, uh, will there be a great tribulation and all that? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think a lot of these things. In, now, to what degree every element of the apocalypse is mirrored at the end of time? I don't know. Uh, anybody who tells you they know everything about that is lying to you and is some kind of John Hagee comment. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe uh, if God grants me the grace in 30 years, if I'm still alive, maybe then I'll know more about that. But I don't pretend to know, and anybody who claims to know all the mysteries of Scripture, especially in regard to the apocalypse, which is you know the, one of the most difficult books, along with the other apocalypses, Zechariah, uh, Ezekiel, uh, they're very difficult books, so uh, we have to tread lightly, and we have to understand that from the Orthodox perspective, there's a lot of factors that will go into how we interpret and understand these texts, which, first of all, can't be done purely by studying and reading books. So the noose has to be cleansed right, through repentance, through good works, ascetic practice, prayer, liturgy. Then we grow in our understanding of these things by God's grace. Uh, and so, and then it's, it's not just us reading, right? It's our experience in the liturgy where God teaches us in the liturgy. We read the lives of the saints. We get taught there. We look at the icons. We read the icons and they teach us as well. We read the Bible. It teaches us. So there's this symbiotic relationship between all of these things. We read the church fathers. They teach us. All of these things go into, right? So then every time we come back to read the Bible, we have an even greater, even broader, better perspective by being immersed in the totality of this experience of the church's life. So all of those things go into it, right? You can't like separate, oh, I just want my Bible. I'm just going to go read my Bible in the corner and I'm going to figure all this stuff out. No, that's idiotic. It's not... That it's not a book that's meant for you to go sit in the corner and figure it all out by yourself. It's not an algorithm that you decode. It has to be a lived thing, right? And uh, I don't care who you are or how much you've read. Like, the apocalypse is a difficult book. And I don't even think that anybody's going to understand all these mysteries until, well, ultimately not until the eschaton, obviously, but... As we get closer to the time of these final, final things, then, yeah, God will grant more understanding to, you know, the saints, the elders, these kinds of people in the church, uh, you know, people who are following him. He will grant the understanding of those things. But as Paul says, let us strive to eat meat and not to only feed on milk, right? What does Hebrews say? You should be taking strong doctrine and meat, not just staying fixated on the milk, the baby stuff. So we are supposed to get into, I mean, they're here for a reason, right? I get sick of the people who are like, well, we don't read that stuff in our church. Well, that's because you're an idiot. The Bible says, scripture says, blessed are those who read the apocalypse. Why would you not want a blessing? I mean, that's, that's idiotic, that's stupid. Anyway, so that's a good introduction to what we, what we want to caution against and the direction that we want to go to understand these very difficult things. And hopefully this can be a good introduction for the future questions of eschatology, Bible prophecy, this kind of stuff that there's so much sensationalism, so much idiocy, so much, so many con men, so much stupid crap 
And look, I was raised in the evangelical goofy stuff. So I'm trying to save you from having to go through a bunch of nonsense. Okay. I, I was a dispensationalist. I thought uh, when I was 19, I bought a prophecy study Bible. I thought John Hagee was right. So I had to go through all this stupid stuff. And I'm just trying to tell you that you don't have to. <laughs> okay. I went through all this crap for you, man. Uh, if you want to be hard headed and go through all that stupid stuff, well, good luck with that. Have fun. Uh, cause it's going to be a nightmare, but this is much better. This is the mature, traditional historic approach. Anyway. So hopefully this has, this is a, we want a sober approach is what I'm trying to do, right? We want to be sober on the one hand, but not fall into the, liberal nonsense on the other hand of like denying the inspiration and all this kind of stuff right just think about jesus day who are the two the two dialectical opposite goofuses that jesus is always having to interact with the scribes and the pharisees and who were the scribes the sadducees the liberals Remember how it says that the, that the Sadducees deny resurrection, that the deny miracles and the existence of angels. And Jesus says that they're idiots and they are hard-hearted and they have no faith. They, 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 they don't believe the scriptures. I mean, he constantly says that to them. They're the liberals. And who are the Pharisees? The, the rigorous, super, super, I'm holier than thou and make, making up all these uh, laws that aren't even in the actual you know, revelation. Right? And guess what? We still have these same two extremes in our day we have the liberals do whatever you want there's no miracles religion is a symbol it's just moral tales or whatever and blah 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 and then you've got rigorist on the other the extremist pharisees and by the way who got the worst condemnation the rigorous now i'm not telling you to be a liberal i'm just saying that how we strike that balance is very important because jesus's harshest condemnations are for the pharisees even above the Sadducees. So I'm not telling you to be a liberal at all, right? I, mean, I believe Jesus is very clear about the inspiration of the text, the inerrancy of the text. He's, he, Jesus has a strong view of inerrancy and inspiration. Uh, and he pronounces a blessing for those who read the Old Testament. He says, you're like a treasure hunter who brings treasure out of old into the new. If you understand and study the old testament he says that not one jot or tittle of the old testament is wrong or will fail so we should get our doctrine of inspiration from christ and from the church fathers and by the way the church fathers teach inerrancy there might be debate like between textual traditions like origin and jerome to uh, patristic era textual critics they might have disputed different copies but Jerome has some of the strongest statements on inerrancy. If you look at what he says on the Psalms, Jerome goes so far as to say that even the, the introductions to the Psalms, even the sections of the Psalms where you have letters like Psalm 110, Jerome says even those are inspired. He says the Holy Spirit put those there. So this idea that, oh, the church fathers, they didn't teach inerrancy. I can, I can be a liberal if I become orthodox. No, you can't. No, you can't. Total nonsense. I could give you 50 quotes from the church fathers on the inerrancy, inspiration, and authority of Scripture. Total misunderstanding. And by the way, smart Protestants can run circles around Catholics and, and dumb Orthodox who think that the church fathers don't teach inspiration and inerrancy. Anyway, let's read some of the Super Chats. So I hope this was helpful just to give a uh, uh, patristic, balanced, traditional interpretation. It is the time of the resurrection. Uh, I mean, technically right now it's like the next day, but today was uh, Resurrection Sunday. I hope everybody had a good Pascha, even though it's a Karanka Pascha, which is all very bizarre. Um, but yeah, we want to understand that let the Bible inform our view of the world. Don't take headlines and read them into the Bible. That's what I'm trying to caution against. You see. Does that mean we can't look at 
the uh, where was my note? Look, I mean, if you think about some of the examples, uh, the rise of occultism, okay, um, brain links, uh, abrasion, right, nano dots, RFID, transhumanism, ecumenism, Internet of Things, five GA, uh, a global economy, universal basic income. into the family are these signs of the time yes they are now a lot of these evils in different forms have been around so I wouldn't immediately say that well we're definitely in the final final end times there's a lot of prophecies that still have to be fulfilled so we know the end of the world is not coming tomorrow but regardless it could be could be the end of the world I don't know I don't claim to know anyway um, so we have to be wise in how we approach these things I would say that if things keep getting crazier and crazier eh, yeah, maybe it is <laughs> maybe we are at the end of the end um, but we'll know we'll know we don't have to worry about that so Jordan Graves $5 Christ arisen new fan here thank you for all or for articulating orthodox philosophy and danger moment. thank you much appreciated glad you're here welcome um, remember the archives there's a vast vast 900 videos now some of them are goofy but the majority of the videos are theology philosophy church fathers uh, debates with atheists etc etc uh, if you're interested in these topics click down to the theology section or to the um, traditional philosophy and metaphysics playlists on the main page you'll find a lot there we also have the global elite book series uh, irish sailor 91 five dollars plot twist q reveals himself as a political leader boomers are we're elected to be president <laughs> yeah that's funny i mean that's yeah, this is uh that's not gonna happen but that's funny jolene k 25 dollars. thank you jolene much appreciate it big supporter a long time jason also supporter shout out jason ray five dollars thank you jay thank you jason much appreciate it irish sailor again he says I have to sleep for work thank you for all that you do you introduce me to orthodox theology and the peace of family fit together christ is risen. he's risen indeed Cody Pemberton, one Canadian. Thank you, Cody. Cody Pemberton, two Canadian. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Cody. He says, are demons archetypes of chaos like reverse Logi? Uh, no, because Logi are uncreated energies that are the uh, patterns and archetypes of all things that are created. So uh, angels are, like all creation, they possess a created nature. The Logi are not identical to created natures or essences. The Logi are uncreated. But created beings have created natures and created essences. So angels uh, are beings that are, uh, they have a angelic nature, and they also have an individual hypostasis, each one of them. Basil's very clear about this in his 38th letter, where he describes nature and person as distinct and the hypostatic properties. And he also explains uh, angels as having an angelic nature and each individual hypostasis so uh of their own as angels um so demons are angels that are created beings that have fallen um and so they're not merely archetypes but they're actually uh personal uh, uh demonic beings uh, their nature is still good but they have confirmed themselves in evil we don't explain exactly understand exactly how it all works in the angelic realm but that's what has been revealed to us about uh, the good angels and the fallen angels. Mark David Chapman. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Uh, is that Jared Leto as Mark David Chapman or the actual Mark David Chapman who faked his death perhaps and is sending me a hundred bucks? Well, much appreciated. Whoever it is. I'm joking. It's not. I don't think that's Jared Leto. But if it is, thank you, Jared. I hope you enjoy your Laurel Canyon pad. Much appreciated for that hundred bucks. Wow. Kevin Fitzgibbon for $4.99. He says, here's my Trump bucks. Yes, actually, a couple of people did send me Trump bucks. Uh, they didn't send me their whole Trump buck check, but <laughs> they did send me some Trump bucks, so I appreciate people who sent Trump bucks. I was actually joking, but thank you guys for sending the Trump bucks. Much appreciated. And Kevin has sent his. And uh, by the way, shout out to um, Tiffany Fitzhenry, you guys are probably familiar with her. She's a pretty well-known YouTuber and tweeter. She has a very large Twitter following, and she gave me a huge shout-out uh, and recommended everybody follow 
on my Twitter today. I think she sent me almost a thousand followers on Twitter today. So I don't think I've ever gained a thousand Twitter followers in one day. So that was pretty awesome. So thank you to her, everybody. Be sure and follow Tiffany Fitzhenry. If you go to my Twitter, I uh, promoted her today as well. So be sure and follow her back. And uh, hopefully we can have some good uh, chats in the future with her about esoteric Hollywood. She is also a uh, writer, exposer of esoteric Hollywood topics as well. Dusty, Dustin Neely, $5, Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. Zachariah Harp, 25 bucks. Thank you. He says, God, speed, and many thanks. Awesome, dude. Thank you. Much appreciated. Hopefully we have a balanced approach to eschatology, hermeneutics from an orthodox biblical perspective. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed the stream. Again, thank you to Mark David Chapman, my uh, assassination bro there, for such a fat super chat. Uh, that was really generous of you. Much appreciated. And uh, I think that's everything. That's all I can think of. Covered all the books I wanted to. Yeah. Uh, God bless everybody. Have a good night. And by the way, the resurrection. Right. I mean, that was the whole point of this. Somebody was getting mad at me at the beginning of the stream. Why are you talking about this? Why are you talking about this? So you bitched about nothing, dude. It was a great stream. We had a, a, a sober discussion of... A topic that everybody's getting overly sensational about. Anyway, God bless everybody. Have a good night.